Welcome, beloved of God, to this service of worship, word and sacrament. Today is the first Sunday in Advent and the beginning of the journey towards the uh, celebration of that incredible gift of the Christ child that was given to us. Our birthday is in the parish this coming week on uh, November the 29th, Dana de Priya. November the 30th, Penny Cooper, December the 4th, Phil Brayshaw, December the 5th, Patrick Robson, Marcella Selepe, and Elena Matthew. We do wish you all a really blessed birthday celebration and that the year that lies ahead will be filled with God's abundant blessings. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We have come together as the family of God in our Father's presence to offer him praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive his holy word, 
to bring before him the needs of the world, to ask his forgiveness of our sins, and to seek his grace, that through his Son, Jesus Christ, we may give ourselves to his service. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Let us confess our sins, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments, and to live in love and peace with our neighbour. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, in penitence we confess that we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, Christ our Lord, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on us, pardon our sins and set us free from them, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Collect for the First Sunday in Advent. Let us pray. Almighty Father, your Son came to us in humility as our Saviour, and that the last day he will come again in glory as our Judge. Give us grace to turn away from darkness to the light of Christ, that we will be ready to welcome him, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. The Old Testament reading comes from Isaiah chapter 64 verses 1 to 9. Why don't you tear the sky apart and come down? The mountains would see you and shake with fear. They would tremble like water boiling over a hot fire. Come and reveal your power to your enemies and make the nations tremble at your presence. There was a time when you came and did terrifying things that we did not expect. The mountains saw you and shook with fear. No one has ever seen or heard of a God like you who does such deeds for those who put their hope in him. You welcome those who find joy in doing what is right, those who remember how you want them to live. You were angry with us, but we went on sinning. In spite of your great anger, we have continued to do wrong since ancient times. All of us have been sinful. Even our best actions are filthy through and through. Because of our sins, we are like leaves that wither and are blown away by the wind. No one turns to you in prayer. No one goes to you for help. You have hidden yourself from us and have abandoned us because of our sins. But you are our Father, Lord. We are like clay and you are like the potter. You created us, so do not be too angry with us or hold our sins against us forever. We are your people. Be merciful to us. Hear the word of the Lord. Psalm 80, verses 1 to 7 and 17 to 19. Hear us, O shepherd of Israel, you that led Joseph like a flock. You that are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine out in glory. 
before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh, stir up your power and come to save us. Restore us again, O Lord of hosts. Show us the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry at your people's prayer? You have fed them with the bread of tears, and have given them tears to drink in good measure. You have made us the victim of our neighbors, and our enemies laugh us to scorn. Restore us again, O Lord of hosts. Show us the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. Let your power rest on the man at your right hand, on that son of man whom you made so strong for yourself. And so we shall not turn back from you. Give us life, and we will call upon your name. Restore us again, O Lord of hosts. Show us the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The second reading comes from 1 Corinthians 1, verses 3 to 9. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. I always give thanks to my God for you because of the grace he has given you through Christ Jesus. For in union with Christ you have become rich in all things, including all speech and all knowledge. The message about Christ has become so firmly established in you that you have not failed to receive a single blessing as you wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end, so that you will be faultless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is to be trusted, the God who called you to have fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. The Gospel Reading Listen to the good news proclaimed in the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 13, beginning to read at the 24th verse. Jesus said, But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time men will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each, each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the cock crows, or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone. Watch. This is the Gospel of Christ. Today is the first Sunday in Advent, the beginning of our new liturgical year in the church calendar. 
We begin again with a season of preparation, building up to the celebration of the birth of Christ on Christmas Day. This is a season that is hugely different to what we see happening in the shops and malls around us. We see everybody celebrating the season with an overabundance of decorations, of Christmas carols and, of course, the odd Boney M song. Shopping, shopping and more shopping with money that we don't have and a sense of hectic busyness around us. This, however, is not what Advent is about. Advent is like a season of darkness where we are searching for a light, for the hope of something better to come. It is a season in which we take time to explore the messianic visions of the prophets of Israel looking to the coming of Christ in glory. It is a season in which we are reminded of the call to repentance and preparation by John the Baptist. It is a season in which we hear the angel's message to a young, unwed teenage girl about the birth of an incredibly special child. Advent is essentially a time where we are called to prepare ourselves for the coming of the Messiah. He who was, he who is, and he who is to come. In much the same way that Lent prepares us for the great celebration of the risen Lord Jesus, Advent calls us to prepare for the incarnation and the second coming of Christ. It is only when we truly prepare ourselves on this Advent journey that we can fully appreciate the great celebration of the birth of the Saviour on Christmas Day. Advent is a season of hoping and longing for something which is better than the broken and unjust world that we live in. I think that this is particularly applicable to us today in light of the whole coronavirus pandemic. Everybody is desperately looking for an end to this pandemic and a return to life as it was. So many people's lives have been devastated and turned completely upside down and are hoping for some sort of reassurance that all is not lost. This sense of longing and waiting and hoping fits into the theme of Advent, and this is the point at which we start on our Advent journey. Looking at our passages for today in the scriptures, we are presented with a theme of this call to be watchful, to be prepared, to reflect, and of course, to hope. Our vestments have changed this morning to the Advent colour of purple, the colour of penitence. We lit the very first candle on our Advent wreath, the candle of hope, implying that in perhaps more ways than one, we are longing for something to change. We're hoping it will happen again, that God will come to our world to give us hope. So here we are on this first Sunday of Advent, waiting for a sign, looking around for something, anything, to lift our hearts, to carry our spirits, to reassure us that we, what we see when we look all around us is not the final word, that there's something better on the horizon that's on its way, something that won't allow us to remain in the pain we've created for ourselves, but rather offers us the opportunity of something more. This morning in this time of worship, we are sitting in the reality of what it means to be human, and we're waiting, waiting for a sign that there's some hope for us, that there is something more. This morning we have read the words of the prophet Isaiah. This passage from Isaiah was composed in the context of a return to the holy city and the promise of a new life. Now you would think that that perspective would be one of a people rejoicing and celebrating, happy to be back in the land that was promised to them, and looking forward to a life of abundance and peace. The problem is that the reality was something quite different than what we'd imagine. After years of living in exile, waiting for the day when finally they'd be rescued from evil and unjust domination by the Babylonian Empire, and returned to their beloved Jerusalem to resume life as they had known it. All of a sudden that day was here, 
and things were simply not as they had imagined they would be. The reality of what surrounded them was not at all like the memories that had kept them going through the years of exile. Jerusalem was essentially devastated, essentially a wasteland of a city, rubble compared to its formal glory. In our passage today, Isaiah is of course no longer a young man, as he was in chapter 6 when he received that magnificent vision in the temple. Now he is an old man who has returned with his people from exile. They return to a city in ruin, a temple in ruin, and their lives in ruin. These were dark days for the people of Israel. And it had been a long time since anyone had seen God do mighty works. So Isaiah this morning pours out this lament, pleading for God to tear the heavens once again. He's longing for God to act. Standing in that rubble of the lost temple, among the ruins of possibly a lost faith, he cries out for God to be visible instead of hidden. In verse 7 he says to us, For you have hidden your face from us. So perhaps this passage from Isaiah is actually a great one for beginning the Advent season, because it is so filled with an eagerness, a yearning for God to reveal himself and for God to act. This yearning, of course, would not really be answered until the birth of Christ centuries later. But that is a good model for us as we prepare for Christmas ourselves. We need to reflect on the deep need we have for Christ. It is a mistake to gloss over the very season for Christ's coming. He came into the world because the world was in sin. The coming of Christ filled a deep need in the people, and it still does that today. If you think about your own lives, can you identify with these words of Isaiah about the hiddenness of God? I suspect that most of us can. Have you ever been in a painful or difficult place in your life and prayed and prayed and prayed, but it felt like you were only talking to yourself? Have you ever stood beside the bed of someone in pain or dying and prayed for God's help, but felt that God was far away? Have you ever felt that God has been hidden for too long? Have you ever wanted God to do something, something like tear the heavens and come down? I'm sure that all of us have felt that way at one time or another. Perhaps those are the people who are struggling the most to get ready for Christmas. How can you properly enjoy Christmas when you feel that God is absent? How can you experience the presence of God when all you now know is the hiddenness of God? Many people of deep faith have also experienced this hiddenness of God. The well-known theologian Henry, Henry Nowen felt that way. In fact, he coined a phrase, the ministry of absence, to describe God's actions among us. He insisted that we should prepare people for God's absence as well as for his presence. The worship service itself, says Noan, expresses the fact of God's absence. He writes the following, and I quote, We eat bread, but not enough to take our hunger away. We drink wine, but not enough to take our thirst away. We read from a book but not enough to take our ignorance away. Around these poor signs we come together and celebrate. What then do we celebrate? The simple signs, which cannot satisfy all our desires, speak first of all of God's absence. He has not yet returned. We are still on the road, still waiting, still hoping, still expecting, still longing. The minister is not called to cheer people up, but modestly to remind them that in the midst of pains and tribulations, the first sign of the new life can be found and a joy can be experienced, which is hidden in the midst of sadness. End quote. The American author Philip Yancey 
confess to this kind of experience as well. In his book, Reaching for the Invisible God, he writes the following. I quote, I experienced the sense of abandonment just as I was making progress spiritually, advancing beyond childish faith, faith to the point where I felt I could help others. Suddenly, the darkness descended. For an entire year, my prayers seemed to go nowhere. I had no confidence that God was listening. No one had prepared me with the ministry of absence. At another point in the book, he writes, God's style often baffles me. He moves at a slow pace, prefers rebels and prodigals, restrains his power, and speaks in whispers and silence. Yet even in these qualities, I see evidence of his long-suffering mercy and desire to woo rather than compel. Looking at the Sunday's Gospel reading, it also seems to speak directly to the spirit of the season that we have begun. Jesus tells us essentially to snap out of it, to get our priorities right, to stay awake, to get ready. The Lord is coming. Being serenely, confidently prepared, being as one with Christ, that is what is important in life. In our hyper-caffeinated world, where we are coping with high levels of family, job, social and economic stress, there's little chance of literally falling asleep on God. But there's a major risk of falling into routines that leave no room for Him, that drag us down in a succession of hectic, godless days. We certainly don't set out to disrespect God, but indirectly we're telling Him that He's got to wait His turn. We have so many more pressing things to do. Advent, I think, is an opportunity to break out of that self-destructive spiral, to put Jesus back in the center of our lives, all possible because of the grace of God. Grace is a gift from God, but grace is no guarantee of holiness. We must cooperate with God's grace to nurture holiness. We must protect it, grow it, and give it back to God. It's the healthiest habit we can ever have. It builds character, serenity, joy, all the great, good, vigorous things of a Christian life. And it all starts with saying, staying spiritually awake, being prepared for Christ's coming, welcoming him into our lives every day, not as some kind of vague abstraction, but as the driving force of our life. It's a very tall order. Merely wishing it won't make it so. We have to work at it. And that's where Advent comes in again. Let's not wait for God to knock. Invite him in every morning, every day, every moment in Advent. And I think that's the hope of Advent. That's the joy of Advent. It's the hope and joy of waiting for the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, as we continue to pray in these 16 days of activism against gender-based violence, we pray for the confidence to raise our voices and to speak out against the injustice of gender-based violence. We pray that eyes, hearts and minds may be open during this time. That, Lord, it is your will that women are treated with respect and dignity. Lord, you are God of the entire universe. All people are made in your image. They are known by you and loved by you. All the resources of the world are yours. Lord, please bring your boundless resources to help women and children around the world who are experiencing violence of any kind. You know each of them by name. We only hear of them, but you see all. We pray for governments around the world to rule wisely and to make and enforce laws to protect women and children from violence. 
Please provide support agencies with the resources they need to provide for the needs of victims. Lord, we pray that you would change the culture that permits, ignores, downplays or excuses violence against women and children throughout the world. Please give your grace, comfort and healing to all those who suffer. We pray for our Advent journey that we have begun. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity for us to examine our hearts once again during this lovely time of Advent and the faith in Christ Jesus that we confess. Keep our hearts aglow with love for Jesus and help us to wonder more and more about the amazing grace that you have shown towards sinful man in sending your only begotten Son to come to earth as a tiny human baby so that he could bear the punishment for the sins of the whole world on his shoulders. It never ceases to amaze us that Christ Jesus should set aside his heavenly glory and be conceived of the Holy Spirit by the Virgin Mary, birthed into the human family as the promised seed of the woman, and be worshipped as a tiny baby in a humble stall at Bethlehem by simple shepherds and singing angels alike. It was love incarnate that visited the earth so many years ago, and that same love saved us from our sins and came to dwell within the hearts of all that trust in Jesus as Saviour. Heavenly Father, accept our grateful sacrifice of praise, and may we come to know you more and love you better in our Advent journey that lies ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
those of you who are going to be participating in the Holy Eucharist, uh, please prepare your bread and the wine as we begin our service with the taking of the bread and the wine. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. For us it becomes the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. For us it becomes the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Worship and praise belong to you, God our Maker. Out of nothing you called all worlds to be, and still you draw the universe to its fulfilment. Dawn and evening celebrate your glory, till time shall be no more. In Christ your Son, the life of heaven and earth were joined, sealing the promise of a new creation, given, yet still to come. Taught by your Spirit, we who bear your threefold likeness look for the city of peace in whose, in whose light we are transfigured and the earth is transformed. As children of your redeeming purpose who await the coming of your Son, we offer you our praise with angels and archangels and the whole company of heaven, singing the hymn of your unending glory. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Glory and thanksgiving be to you, most loving Father. In Jesus you showed us yourself. Our hope is built on him, the first, the last, the living one. Obedient even to accepting death, he opened the gate of glory and calls us now to share the life of heaven. Before he was given up to suffering and death, a light with the vision of a feast that heralded a kingdom yet to come, at supper with his disciples, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke the bread and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, it is broken for you. After supper, he took the cup and again offered you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. It is poured out for you and for all, that sins may be forgiven. Do this in remembrance of me. We obey your Son's command. We recall Christ's blessed passion and death. We celebrate Christ's glorious resurrection and ascension. 
we look for the coming of Christ's kingdom. Made one with Christ, we offer you these gifts, and with them, we offer ourselves as a single, holy, living sacrifice. Hear us, most merciful Father, and send your Holy Spirit upon us, and upon this bread and this wine. By the Spirit's life-giving power, may they be for us the body and blood of your Son, and kindled by the fire of your love, may we be renewed for the service of your kingdom. Make us grow together in unity and love, until at last in your new creation we enter our true eternal home, where with Mary, the mother of our Lord, and the holy ancestors of every generation, we will worship you in glory everlasting. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be to you, now and forever, world without end. Amen. As Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those that sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The bread which we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, give us your peace. Come to this table, not because we must, but because we may. Not to testify that we are righteous, but that we sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ and desire to be his true disciples. Not because we are strong, but because we need strength. Not because we have any claim on heaven's rewards, but because in our frailty and sin we stand in constant need of heaven's mercy and help. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The body of Christ broken for us. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for us. Amen.
Give thanks to the Lord, for He is gracious. His mercy endures forever. Almighty and eternal God, we thank you for feeding us in these holy mysteries with the body and blood of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and for keeping us by your grace in the body of your Son, the company of all faithful people. Help us to persevere as living members of that holy fellowship and to grow in love and obedience according to your will, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Father Almighty, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out into the world in the power of the Holy Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. God bless Africa, protect our children, transform our leaders, heal our communities, restore our dignity, and give us peace. For Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. May Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you, scatter the darkness from your path, and make you ready to meet Him when He comes in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, remain with us always. Amen. So dear friends, go in the light of Christ to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.